Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit webinar series. My name is Nick Cooper from the Tourism Collective, and we are delivering this webinar on behalf of the Australian government. I am a tour sustainable tourism specialist at the Tourism Collective, a small Australian tourism consultancy, um, but I also run a small ecotourism business on the Mornington Peninsula, which I've built to have a strong sustainability ethos. This is webinar three of a four part series. The webinar series has been developed as part of the National Sustainability Framework. And the purpose of these webinars is to run you through the key topics of the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit at a high level. The webinars feature examples of tourism businesses taking sustainable actions to inspire your own thinking. And the toolkit is a new resource published at the end of the last year, end of last year. It's a free how-to guide and it contains practical advice to help Australian tourism businesses become more sustainable. It's aimed at SMEs. I hope you get a lot out of today, but before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land I'm speaking from uh, today. As I mentioned before, I'm based on the Mornington Peninsula and I acknowledge the Bunurong Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation who have cared for the waters and land we now call Australia for millennia. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend those respects to the First Nations country and people from where you are tuning in from today. The ground beneath our feet is infused with wisdom, stories and songs that reach beyond our knowing. A bit of housekeeping. This webinar is going to be recorded. My colleague Brooke, who you can also see there, is on the chat box. And she'll be sharing links throughout the webinar today. So um, things that we're referring to throughout the webinar, she'll be sharing some links uh, to that one. To use this webinar, you'll see a chat box function um, and also a question box function. Everyone is muted on this. Um, so if you do have any questions, please put your questions in the question box as we go through the webinar today. And at the end of the webinar, we'll have around 10 minutes um, and Brooke and I will do our best to cover some of those questions that may not have been covered off in the webinar today. So I'm going to turn my camera off now just so you guys get um, can focus in on the slides of what's going on and then um, we'll pop through uh, the webinar and get cracking on this uh, webinar two which is all about respecting culture. The toolkit is part of a training activation program to help the industry become more sustainable. And it's a true national commitment and joint initiative between Austrade, Tourism Australia, and the state and territory tourism organizations. The toolkit is a national resource for all businesses. However, some of those states um, and Tourism Australia might have additional uh, resources on sustainability uh, for you to dip into. So we encourage you to look into them too if you need to. So on the toolkit today, we're going to go through a bit of a recap of the toolkit. If this is the first webinar that you're joining, we're then going to unpack, unpack chapter three. So um, chapter three is all about respecting culture and we're going to go through that and then hopefully provide some ideas on taking action in your business. So to recap on the toolkit, the National Sustainability Framework for the Visitor Economy and the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit is a key deliverable of Australia's National Tourism Strategy, Thrive 2030. The Sustainable Tourism Toolkit is the how, and that's what we're going to be taking through you through today for this respecting culture pillar and giving you some real life examples of um, how that is being um, activated in our tourism industry. The toolkit comes in two versions comes in a detailed PDF version where you can get real detail on each of the, the sections of the toolkit. And then there's a shorter uh, bite-sized online version as well. Brooke's gonna be sharing links to both the uh, PDF version and the online version uh, to be dipped into and to refer to for yourself. We recommend using the toolkit like a toolkit. So get going into the section that you need the tool from and uh, using it in that way. So it's a fantastic resource to use um, and utilizing it in a way where you can find the information that you would like to improve on your business when it comes to sustainability is a really effective way of using the tool. The toolkit um, sets out practical advice, guidance and actions your business can take to improve your practices across the four pillars of sustainability. 
And so you'll see in each of the sections an introduction on why the topic is in, an important part of sustainability, top tips and actions to take. There's a, a glossary with um, key terms to familiarize yourself with. Um, there's links to sources for further advice, tools and templates. And then at the end of each uh, pillar, there's first steps, actions to start you uh, on your journey and next steps, actions offering more advanced and best practice advice to take you further on your sustainability journey. So as I mentioned, today is webinar three of four covering the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit. The, all the webinars are being recorded and a copy will be emailed out to you um, after each of these. So if you haven't watched webinar one on taking a managed approach or webinar two on environmental and climate action, we highly encourage you to go back and watch these um, and check them out as well as today's recording. And then we cover off chapter four creating positive social impact and chapter five promoting your sustainability story on the 15th of May and again encourage you to check out those recordings on that one. So let's jump into chapter three of the sustainable tourism toolkit and unpack that a bit. This is all about respecting culture and that is done in a multitude of ways and the toolkit lays out how that can be done. We're just going to do a quick poll for um, the attendees today. So if you could scan that QR code with your phone and it's going to ask you a multiple choice question of how confident do you currently feel to implement respecting culture practices in your business? Rick, if you could let me know as those answers come through, that'd be um, great. Absolutely, Nick. Um, got some really good answers coming through fairly confident um and and slightly confident um are the two um that majority have voted for right now nick perfect and as we've mentioned on the previous webinars regardless of where your confidence is at from this the toolkit and these webinars are all about giving you food for thought and ideas and practical advice and information and resources to really help increase that confidence and um, help you implement these practices of respecting culture across your business more deeply. So sustainability involves respectfully acknowledging and including the different cultures in your destination, working cooperatively with local First Nations and multicultural communities will bring out the best of your destination and give visitors an authentic and high quality experience. So key topics we're going to explore today are protecting and preserving cultural assets, engaging respectfully with and learning from First Nations people, respecting First Nations people in people's enduring traditional knowledge and celebrating Australia's diversity and multicultural communities. It's worth noting as well that respecting culture, you know, truly, deeply and authentically might seem a daunting task sometimes. And sometimes it's tricky to know how to do that really in, in, in the right way. But there's lots you can do and there's lots of that that low hanging fruit, those simple, quick changes that you can do, which can make a big difference in respecting culture uh, more and more deeply, particularly in the community that your business is operating in. So embracing cultural sustainability can help your business by reaching new markets and expanding your customer base, fostering creativity and innovation, strengthening regional identity, and creating unique and authentic experiences. The environment is often top of mind when you think about sustainability, but alongside the environment, respectful engagement with our diverse mix of cultures is an essential part of the overall sustainability of your business. And I guess a key part of that is to, it's really important to distinguish the difference between an acknowledgement of country and a welcome to country and it shows some examples of how these can be delivered and acknowledge that you know there may be a lot of people on, on the call today that do these really beautifully and really well we're just giving some examples and just defining so it's really clear of the difference between the two so an acknowledgement of country is a respectful statement that shows you are aware of who the traditional owners are of the country that you are on anyone non-indigenous businesses um, included can conduct an acknowledgement of country Whereas a welcome to country is a ceremony that 
receives you on country and can only be delivered by traditional owners. It will vary based on the customs and traditions of the traditional owners of the country that you are on. So finding out who and consulting with the traditional owners of the country you're on is really, really important. Heading onto the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies website can be a good way to find this out. But placing your acknowledgement of country on your website, in your email signature, in your office or in your venue, and even in person um, acknowledging country when you're welcoming visitors is a really um, important thing to do. There's a few options on here. So the, the top bar from there is from the website of Blue Derby Top Rides, who haven't taken that sort of, I guess, scripted version that you often hear of um, of an acknowledgement of country they try to make that more personal and deep to place from where they operate and do that in a really beautiful way at wild adventures melbourne which is the business i own on the mornington peninsula i try to infuse um you know traditional indigenous place names uh into that so part of that is is for respect and also education as well and trying to sort of um really make that more personalized to place and put that acknowledgement on both my signature and website and in person when I'm speaking to our guests too. So meeting with traditional owners in your area is a really good and strong way to build relationships, learn about their culture and heritage, and where appropriate work in collaboration to include First Nations culture in your experience. It's really good practice to meet with the traditional owners before starting any new development or creating a new experience that involves exploring the environment. For advice on contacting traditional owners in your area, speak to your local council or the National Indigenous Australians Agency uh, regional office. So before engaging with First Nations people and communities, you, it's, it's worth considering the intent of your connection, who in your community you should be connecting with, their preferred connection method, how often to communicate, and how you can show your thanks for their time and knowledge. Often this may include payment. An example of Euroa Arbiturian in Northeast Victoria, who have created a climate ready garden, developed showcasing native plants that require minimal water um, to grow. They've collaborated with the Tungarong elders to create a welcome circle, the first ceremonial circle for welcome visitors on Tungarong land. So they've connected with the traditional owners, but then they've also built something really beautiful to collaborate and support the traditional owners in the place that they are. This is Country Food Trails in New South Wales, who have a tasting tour of the town of Orange. Um, and on that tasting tour, they meet an indigenous elder and taste native plants and foods. The tour also includes a downloadable guide for the, the visitors coming on that tour to indigenous plants as well. So giving that ongoing under, um, connection and learning and education about native plants too, as part of the tour. Big Heart Adventures um, have a traditional owner welcome and guiding as part of their walk the York Peninsula multi-day tours as well. So bringing a traditional owner in to be really involved on that, which is a great way of doing things. And then there's um, indigenous engagement. So supporting indigenous education, employment and tour tourism initiatives is something that um, Ayers Rock Resort in the Northern Territory uh, does really well. They have a drone laser and light show that tells a chapter of the ancestral traditional owner history and it's been created in partnership with senior traditional owners. They also run a national indigenous training academy as well. So really, really uh, important area to, to look at and um, some really great examples in the toolkit of, of how it's actually done. If you are planning a project that impacts Aboriginal land and resources, understand FPIC. So that stands for free, prior and informed consent. So free, prior and informed consent is about inclusion, disclosure and respect for traditional owners' decision-making processes. So free is consent that has been provided freely without fear, coercion, threats or manipulation. Prior is any information or plans for a project are provided to First Nations stakeholders with sufficient time to review and decide prior to commencement of the activity. 
informed is information method of delivery such as language and format and engagement about a project is transparent truthful balanced and accurate and consent is the right of the community to make the decision about the practice the graphic you can see on the right hand side of the screen there is all about building cultural capacity on your business so that knowing being and doing what do you know as a business how what do you understand about history culture custom and beliefs what are you being how are you being awareness authenticity and openness to examining your own values and beliefs and then what are you doing what's culturally appropriate action and behavior and i guess another really important of action of that is respecting cultural intellectual property so intellectual property rights covers people's artworks traditional knowledge and cultural expressions there are things you can do to make sure you're supporting artists and their communities. So where possible, buy art direct from members of the Indigenous Art Code, seek permission before taking and publishing photos or videos, do other things like crediting authors, creators, contributors or custodians or ceremonies, dance or songs, and ask permission to use things like traditional knowledge um, and things like that too. Example here is from Bendigo Visitor Centre, which contains um, some goods uh, for sale, um, some souvenirs and things like that, which have been made by um, Indigenous art artisans. Um, so again, way of showcasing those local artisans and selling them, um, it, you know, authentically to the to the visitor that's coming in and looking for those particular items. Another really important area to look at is to look at your supply chain and to purchase potentially look at what goods in your supply chain could be purchased from first nations led businesses so this may include local artists and creatives may include retail off offerings um, may include back of house suppliers that you use even uh, the produce that you use and the growers providing that produce and potentially native ingredients as well there are online uh, websites such as Supply Nation that, where you can look up um, fully or part owned indigenous businesses um, on that directory there. And they've even got a refine tool where you can refine it by state and even things like refine it by a female owned indigenous businesses to really find the type of business in the location that you're looking to. Many states also have their own directory of businesses where you can filter to look for locally owned First Nations um, led, people's led businesses. Uh, in South Australia, for example, they have their industry advocate website where you can start looking for those types of businesses too. So can you bring practices to reflect place in your experience or product? There's a lot of considerations here to look at. Things like employing local, providing a platform for First Nations people and multicultural communities to tell their story. Things like food gardens, community engagement, collaboration for economic distribution, building design, language, lots of areas to look at to reflect place where your business is operating. Spring Bay Mill in Triabunna in Tasmania has uh, smoking ceremonies, provided by traditional owners for the groups that are staying there. They uh, offer bush, food, bush foods walks led by Palawa guides. They have an online on-site plant and bush food nursery. And they also work with Aboriginal rangers to reintroduce cultural burning practices into the site's extensive, instant, extensive bushland too. Having a look at collaborations in your business as well. Who can you work with? Um, are there trad traditional owners or indigenous owned businesses that you can work with in your business? And um, there's some great examples here. So Bridge Climb in Sydney have an Aboriginal climb experience where they can, where visitors can scale the bridge with a First Nations storyteller um, as the actual guide. Palo Kipli in Tasmania, who's an indigenous food tour company, runs uh, classes with Tasmanian chefs to work with native ingredients and traditional cooking methods. Mount Zero Olives in Victoria, which is a non-indigenous owned business, collaborated with the Burundi Gajin Land Council to harvest and sell Pink Lake salt, which they harvest there and gave them an avenue to sail for that salt that they've been harvesting for thousands and thousands of years. Other collaboration examples is collaborating with cultural tour operators. So Tabilk Winery in central Victoria near Nagambi 
have um, an indigenous flora trail um, on their property. And they develop that in collaboration with the Tungarong elders, the traditional owners there. And then a local cultural tour company, Wawa Bic, they actually offer a, a tour uh, across that indigenous flora trail. So they've um, done a beautiful collaboration in that respect. Looking at partnerships can be a great option too. So Tasmanian e-bike adventures, what they do really beautifully is they, they co-host their cultural regeneration adventures on Maria Island with local First Nations hosts. Uh, here's a couple of examples from South Australia and I think Brooke um, being based in South Australia is going to talk to a couple of these. Yeah, thank you Nick. Um, the Barley Stacks Wines is a local winery that I actually had the pleasure of working with um, in my previous role um, as a regional tourism organisation manager. Um, and they partnered with a local indigenous horticulturalist who was working, the farm was located not far from the winery. Um, and they were decided to partner together to run a wild winter harvest food event, um, which they then made into quite a significant event, made it as part of the Tasting Australia program, uh, which is a statewide uh, food celebration held here in South Australia. And that, that partnership and collaboration was very much formed quite informally. It was more just, um, we'd love to use the local herbs um, that you're growing down the road and how can we kind of partner together to make it quite a special event. So again, quite an informal approach to that, but ended up being a very significant um, and successful event. Uh, the Watervale Hotel, again, another event partnership, uh, Watervale Hotel based in Clare Valley in South Australia. So they partnered with Elder Angelina um, to create quite a, a reconciliation event at the historic site, um, which is the Watervale Hotel. And that there was an event take place there um, more than I believe 150 years ago, um, which was called the Breaking of the Bread. Um, so the chef and manager of the Watervale Hotel worked with the elder Angelina, Aunty Angelina as, as she's known locally, um, for both visitors and locals to create um, quite a historic event there. Um, and I believe it was the largest gathering of First Nations women held locally in that area for more than 150 years. So quite a special event, Nick. Um, and then we've got Coonawarra Experiences, again, um, have partnered with local traditional owner, Uncle Ken, um, Coonawarra based in the Limestone Coast in South Australia. And this is for selected tours only. So visitors can book on, on a traditional um, owner experience there to, to look at some of the fantastic things that are in the region and Uncle Ken really kind of discusses the native bush tucker and tells some, I believe, I haven't personally experienced it, but some fabulous um, ancient history storytelling as well. So an another example of some great key collaboration. Thanks Brooke. So as Brooke is mentioning there and some of the case studies we've already mentioned is that respecting and supporting culture can start with a, a simple connection, a, a collaboration and an idea to work together. And there can be um, some of that really quick and easy wins. And one of them can be language. So dual naming um, your you know, First Nations words or place names um, in social media, blogs, storytelling when you're speaking to your customers as well, um, even on signage that reflects the country you're on can be a really um, great way of doing that. Uh, you've got a couple of examples there. There's a social post in your top left from East Arnhem Land who put in brackets um, the different, um, sorry, they, they've put the, you know, the traditional names across the the post there and then they put in brackets I guess the the English versions of those names as well so um, really great way of doing it you know there's another example on your screen there that's from Melbourne Uni but it could happen anywhere where they've got welcome and then woman jika as well uh, the indigenous word for that too so um, infusing that uh, across all of your different channels um, and in person is, is a really uh, great way of educating your, your guests and also showing respect and relatively easy to do in, in a lot of places as well. So it's worth you know, checking out that, that everything you're, you're, you're using with those words are the, the, the correct and uh, right ones to use. Um, five of 50 tours, they work with indigenous communities and local guides, um, and they have many itineraries that includes the opportunities for guests 
to partake in in cultural tours and experiences. Um, one of these is cultural preservation in WA with a uh, with a local First Nations group as well. So um, it's a really great way of guests really getting involved and experiencing and um, collaborating and understanding and and ultimately uh, a more sort of respectful and culturally enriching experience. And Australia is well known globally for our incredible natural landscapes, unique experiences, warm hospitality and friendly people. But how can your business champion diversity for your visitors, staff and community? So culture goes um, through beyond First Nations culture and then also to multicultural um, communities and visitors um, and staff as well in your business too. So there's lots of ways to do that. Um, and engaging with all visitors with warmth and respect helps create a positive impression and welcoming environment. There's many ways that you could respectfully engage with your visitors, such as providing staff training and how to do this, uh, language assistant to meet those visitors coming in that might be um, from different countries, speaking different languages, having clear points of contact, considering even developing a reconciliation action plan, which we'll mention about a bit later in this webinar, working with local communities, um, understanding your market and walking the talk too. So for staff training, look to provide your staff with training on the importance of respectful communication, including how this may differ across different cultural backgrounds. For First Nations cultural competency, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies website is a really, really good resource to go on to and um, provides online training on how to do that. And then perhaps looking, understanding your visitors and supporting their needs. Um, this could be language assistance. So if you have visitors um, from specific countries, then consider a, consider translating key signage, your website, etc. So Taronga Zoo in Sydney, their website um, it has versions in lots of different languages, which you can see on the image there on the drop down tool part bar. But then also in person, you know, during their guidebooks and things as well. It goes beyond that. It's understanding visitors' needs, dietary, cultural, religious uh, ability, um, to create a welcoming environment for visitors. So having a look at all of those areas and seeing what you can potentially do. I mentioned br briefly before about creating, um, developing a reconciliation action plan. And that's a consideration to do to help you learn about First Nations cultural practices and protocols. A wrap can help you build relationships, respect and opportunities through collaboration with First Nations people. Um, you can find more about the wrap on the Reconcilia Reconciliation Australia website. A couple of examples on your screen. So Reflection Holiday Parks in New South Wales, they include a participation in local community events and engagement of Aboriginal service providers. Um, their reconciliation action plan is, is publicly displayed, um, so you can see that as well. Virgin Australia, um, the reason I share that is because on their in-flight app, when you're flying with them, you can click on their reconciliation action plan and actually read through it as well. I just guess it's a really good example of um, making that visible if you go through the process of doing a wrap and um, making it readily available for your customers to, to read and see some of the amazing things that you're doing to respect culture too. Make sure you address not just first people diversity, but also inclusive of diverse and rich background of people from other cultures and backgrounds. So um, the example on your screen is from Common Ground Project in Victoria, which is a social enterprise restaurant and regenerative farm. They actually have a program called Staying Grounded, and that program um, provides employment pathways from, for mainly women seeking asylum and refugees. And they actually run these lunches, these Staying Grounded lunches, where people get to go and taste this amazing um, cuisine from different cultures that's being cooked by these, these women coming in and who are part of the program and sharing those food experiences as well. So really um, great way that your business can walk the talk when it comes to demonstrating its values and efforts to create a diverse and inclusive environment. Creating a safe, welcoming and accepting environment extends beyond your workplace and encompasses your whole community and your visitors. 
So taking action in your business is um, a really important area to take. So from what we've covered today, when it comes to taking action in your business, we recommend you have a look at pages 40 and pages 41 of the toolkit, which has two fantastic summaries of first step and the next step ideas to consider for your business to progress to respecting culture. We recommend you have a look at these lists and see what is the most relevant to your business and then work out how you can put into action some of those steps too. You also see on those steps the um, cost indications too of, of, I guess, indications of how much they can potentially be as an investment budget wise for your, your business um, to see which of those steps that, that you can plan and uh, start to action too. So your next steps are looking at chapter three, supporting culture and looking at the tips um, and the advice and the content through there to review your business approach to respecting culture. Using the first steps and the next steps at the end of chapter three, supporting culture and using those checklists to help you guide budget and prioritize your actions. Then looking to set yourself some of those short and longer term goals supporting culture. So remember those short goals are, the goals are those, you know, those quick and easy um, changes that you could make to support culture more, more deeply in your business. Um, and we highly recommend going back and watching webinar one and two for a recap on creating your own action plan and environmental and climate action. We'd love to get your thoughts in the chat now of um, what's one idea from that may be prompted from the webinar today that you could apply in your business in the short term. So is there anything that you could, you've could you seen in the webinar today or any ideas that, that you have that you could go, I, I can go away and do this and this is going to be a really great way that we can more deeply respect culture um, where our business operates. So um, yeah, Brooke, if you could keep an eye on that chat function and see some of the comments that are coming through from, from some of the group in there, but I would love to hear some of those options and Brooke, it'd be great if you could read some of those out. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. Yeah, we've got them coming through. Thanks everyone. Um, and, and look, some of them are exactly what we spoke about, just small, simple steps like starting to um, need to do an acknowledgement of country, um, using dual names on socials and websites. And um, I've been, fortunate to um, work in a region where we were the first visitor guide um, as, as a region who used dual language um, in their visitor guide. And again, just small, simple steps. Um, some of the other questions coming through or answers are diversifying our supply chain um, with Kinawa uh, certified organisations, um, developing welcome to country signage um, and, and being having that in language. Um, and a lot of them, are simple things like having that acknowledgement on the first page of our website um, and locally sourced traditional food produce. So some great answers coming through, Nick. Yeah, beautiful. And that that acknowledgement, um, you know, can be on that bottom bar of your of your website. So it's infused across all pages of your website. Uh, can be in your in in your signature. The tours I run on the Mornington Peninsula at the start of every tour, then. Um, we actually start the tours very near the highest point of the Mornington Peninsula, which um, was, you know, named Arthur's Seat by the, the British, but uh, its real name is Wonga. So we we'll always start with an acknowledgement and then um, providing some information about what they're seeing around us and some of those um, indigenous names too. So it um, can, be, can be a really great way to infuse across everywhere you're doing it. And then if you are an accommodation or a hospitality venue and you can um, provide that signage as well then that's an even uh, more beautiful way for your guests to to understand more about the the, the country that they're on yep fantastic nick i've also got another great one that's just come through um my takeaway here is to provide our staff with an on-country experience led by Pelawa. so we our team understand the cultural assets and more of the country and the site that we work on and I think that's a really great point in just becoming that more, um, if, you, if you've never undertaken cultural awareness training, just actually getting out on country um, with your local community and your First Nations community, um, just to gain that appreciation and education is a fantastic first step. Yeah, lovely. 
So, Brooke, has there been, um, I'll turn my camera back on now, but um, has there been any questions that have been coming through or, or if anyone's on who would like to ask any questions about the webinar or anything in general, then please feel free to put that into the question box on there. Um, and yeah, Brooke, if you just let us know if, about any of those coming through and any other questions you have. Um, we've got nothing at the moment, um, Nick, but I know we spoke about briefly some, some quick wins um, or some, some quick changes that you can make in your business. So yep. can I throw a question to you? What are some of those quick changes um, that businesses could make to support local culture more or more deeply if they're already on the journey? Yeah, I guess I can give some examples of the of the tour business Wild Adventures Melbourne I run on the Mornington Peninsula where thing from social posts we do where you know trying to find out indigenous names of different place names across the peninsula here and then including them in the um, you know even as something as simple as we serve um working with um, sourcing a native tea from a local um, indigenous owned business um, is a real simple way of doing it donating a portion of of, of every sale to um, a group called the stars foundation which helps support uh, first nations uh, women through education and empowers them and helps to find them in, in employment afterwards um, was just a connection that we that we set up and then we also connect with um, you know just starting those conversations with uh, local traditional owner groups or local um, First Nations owned organizations um, is, is a great way of, of going, you know, how can we connect with you, support you and things like that. That's led on to us running, um, you know, free uh, stand up paddle boarding sessions with um, groups from a, a Koori youth and um, alcohol and drug rehabilitation service center that's based here on the Mornington Peninsula. So, you know, just connecting with, with, with the, the different First Nations group and having a chat or even looking at products that you offer and going, you know, is there, a, is there an option here that, that's owned by, a, a, it's an indigenous owned uh, business. Um, it can just be those, those, just those simple changes to do that and um, can be a great way of doing it too. Fantastic. And we've just got another question come through here. Um, how do you actually go about approaching your local community? And, and I think that's that's a really great question. And um, in, a, in my previous experience, your state tourism organisation, your regional tourism organisation and your local council are three really great places to start to try and find who is the right person to speak to. Um, and often those organisations already have established relationships or are establishing relationships. Um, so they should be able to point you in the right direction of either, as I said, who, who is the right person, whether that is direct to an elder or whether there is an organisation like a, an Aboriginal corporation um, or, or lands trust that you could speak to. Do you have anything further to add to that one, Nick? No, I think that's, yeah, really well. I think there, there's a resource as well that's in the toolkit too, where you can link through and, um, find out the right traditional owner group and then look to reach out and connect with with them as well and uh, you know start that conversation yeah um we've just had another really good comment made in here and that obviously the relationship has to be um reciprocate reciprocated sorry um obviously that is important for for any relationship but particularly um when you are trying to establish a relationship with your with your first nations and local community so thank you for that comment beautiful Thank you. Um, yeah, Brooke, if there's not another any other questions that come through, we can head to um, this poll again at the end of the, of the webinar, which is after attending uh, today's webinar, how confident are you now feeling in implementing respecting culture practices in your business? Brooke, if you could just give us a heads up as they come through. I certainly can. And um it's looking very positive, Com fairly confident and completely confident um, are the two strongest answers there, Nick. Great. And yeah, so it's about, you know, referring back to that, the the toolkit and looking at chapter three and going in and out of it and looking at the different, the first and next steps and seeing what ideas prompt. I also recommend, you, you know, even reviewing it on an annual basis and going, what could we do this next year that we haven't done this previous year? How can we 
make improvements and it's all about what we talked about before that progress not perfection there's that mark twain uh, quote of continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection so looking at what you can improve and taking action um, is really really important and it's an ongoing process as well next week wednesday the 15th of may is the um final webinar of this series uh webinar four um we cover chapter four and five in that webinar so it's really really full of so much fantastic content of about creating a positive social impact in your business and promoting your sustainability story so please uh, share and invite um, that and please feel free to share the replay of this webinar with your colleagues and um, you know anyone else in your in your industry connections as well uh, we hope to see you live on the 15th of May and on behalf of myself and Brooke we really appreciate uh, you taking time to join this today and we really hope you got a lot out of this webinar and get a lot out of the toolkit um, chapter three respecting culture so thank you very much uh, look after yourself and we'll see you at the next uh, and final webinar on the 15th of May